two, three, listen. Oh, so for today's vlog cast I'm very pleased to be with Jamie once again and today a very special guest is Martin who is one of our examiners and coaches with um, SIA Austria and you work when in as well in, in Austria? I work at the Ski Academy in St. Christoph uh, during the peak winter actually. Yeah. Okay so in San Anton yeah. Yep, perfect. Okay, so let's get straight into it. We're very fortunate. Um, I know many of you have sent us through videos for us to analyze. And today, because we're looking at more performance style skiers, and here is our first guy. Um, thank you for the video. Um, we're pleased to be able to um, look at real life candidates that we've never skied with, actually. We're just first seeing this um student if you like through our online source um yeah uh, we can see obviously condition wise it was quite tricky it's not the best snow and um it's clearly end of season or summer or something and from the equipment side we don't really know what equipment you're on i can pause it have a look but it's it's difficult to see so any idea boys looking pretty good not not bad skiing eh? well if you especially have a look at the last part of the turn, you'll find his body in a quite kind of backseat position, which, yeah, we are talking about fore and aft, but at this stage, it's more like a passive position, less than a movement. Um, this is in combination with the stance, obviously, blocking him from proceeding, from putting more effort into the uh, run, from a more sportive run then. Okay. So from, from our side, yeah, I mean, obviously fore and aft's a bit of a, a difficult um, topic because I think when it's, it's, it's misunderstood a lot because when ski instructors say you need to be forward, I get that, but actually there's a big problem with timing in fore and aft and people mistime their movements of getting into the middle, the fore and the aft of the ski. Is it not, would you not agree, Martin, that the realm of the expert is actually the, the guy who can control the length of the ski? Absolutely. And you do want to transfer your body, your center of mass from the tips to the tail throughout the turn, actually, yeah. Yeah, and it is for me as well because I think is you know there's a lot of steering coming from the upper body. If you're not on the center of the platform, or if you if you're not on your on your axis, then you don't have the access to the steering from the correct places. So then you would use something higher up the chain. And a lot of time you see with more female skiers, skiers it's generally the the hips that come out, or with guys, men that you rely on the upper body to bring the platform round. Um, and I think yeah, you just you, you see it at the end of the turn that inside shoulder drops. And rotates back, and the outside shoulder comes around. Okay, I mean, what what I notice is something which uh, I've sort of been working on a bit with people. <coughs> Excuse me, and that is that there is a lack of ability to activate his ankle joint and his subtalar joint. So this is something which you can clearly see here if I go back a few frames. What you'll see is as he enters the turn, his outside left knee here is actually going the wrong way. It's buckling in this direction. It's almost like he's flattening the ski off. And this is usually a problem. And it may be just simply boot alignment that he, he's got issues with his boots. But he has no knee angulation. And okay, because when we talk about long turns, dynamic long turns, what you don't want is a huge amount of knee angulation. You know, your leg is longer and straighter. But in this case here, I would argue that it's, it's even to the point of where, especially in his later turns, if we go to one of his faster runs... Um, I think if you, if you went back to that position and that drawing that you had there, you could see he's body was already moving off its axis. It's already, you know, there's rotation there. 
and you could see the inside ski just you know you had a little bit of um split going on some diversion of the skis where there's more pressure on the inside than the outside ski so the outside is getting lost a little bit and then you get that little bit of chatter towards the end of the turn as well so it might be you're saying you you know you're talking more about the mechanics of the turn and stuff like that and what you possibly think was an issue maybe in equipment or his own body yeah. with the limited mobility but then if we're looking at technique on the hill what we're going to tell him on the hill and we can't really address his mobility necessarily within the boot and we can't really adjust his equipment so what jamie is saying is that when he makes this turn you can clearly see that the tails wash out when he goes around this next turn so as he and there's his his leg position split stance here and, and there's no engagement at the tip at the start top of the turn yeah. four and a half we're talking earlier i want to see that tip and now we're we engaging this early on um, what you also see quite nicely here, com uh, when you take the picture here now, where Paul is drawn, and compare it to the other curve, uh, you see here it's more of an inclination. So the entire body tilts like inwards. Um, in the left turn, he's got a better idea of edging the skis, of bringing the knees inwards, respectively keeping the upper body a a slightly above the legs and more like outwards, where we then kind of Sorry about the word again, so talking about the Alpine basic position, but you guys covered that already in another podcast, um, which makes the right turn a bit wider than the left turn, actually. Yeah. And I think as well regarding pressure is when you start to come to more performance turns is if you go back to that kind of basic thinking of skiing of the up and waiting at the start of the turn and then actively pressurizing from the fall line to the end of the turn to create that control, um, you can see that's present there, which I don't feel like that's present in performance skiing. I think you're searching for just constant grip. You're searching for a feeling of, you know, having connection with the ground all the time. You can see it goes very light because the tip's not contacted with the snow at the start of the turn as well. So I think it would be good to work with the sensation of just trying to search for pressure all the time, search for a platform all the time in the turn. And this slide here, you can see what I'm talking about now, yeah? So here, it's literally like he's bow-legged at this point here and this this obviously this makes me this makes me concerned because if he's bow legged there that is a, a, an idea that he's flattening the ski off as opposed to in the turn below you can see how i've inclinated at this stage and the edge angle or the the critical edge angle of the ski is what's important now and he doesn't he doesn't have that I think it, with with that slide as well is I think if you don't work from the ground up over and you start to throw large masses inside the turn too early on when you don't have steering pressure, you could see that sometimes where you get that slight divergence that we're seeing. I think you've always got to work from the feet of going big toe, little toe, ankles, knees. So you're building up with lower limb angulation. Then we're moving the center of mass in, especially when you're going slow speeds. You can't just start to work with the, the hips straight away early on. Otherwise, you see that washout. And you see that kind of splitting of the ski slightly. Yeah. So we're talking about, I mentioned the word critical edge angle. Um, and it's important that you understand that when a skier, and you're never going to get a ski to grip unless you have this critical edge angle, which is usually between about 89, maybe it's 90 degrees. In this diagram here, it's pretty clear. It's, it's, the, it's the lining up of the force from my center of mass through to that center of pressure of the outside ski. And that is the edge angle I'm looking at. Now, when we look at the skier here go down, um, we can see, you know, it's a good skier. She's doing the standard ski instructor double pole draggy drill. But if we watch the outside leg, we can see the same thing happening as what we've just saw in the, the previous video. And look at the critical edge angle now. So it should be at 89 and here we are at 104. And because of that, exactly the same thing happens where I look at that outside knee and look at the ankle joint. Okay, so what I'm seeing there is no activation of the subtalar joint and the lever of the ankle is not being used correctly at this point. What will happen then is the outside ski is going to feel like it's moving away and there's going to be a sensation of falling onto the inside ski and a sensation of the skis in the base of support going apart. So the, regarding the other video, obviously, that's the first time I've seen that video, but I know Catherine a little bit. I've skied with Catherine quite a bit. And um, 
she was guilty of what I was saying just before about just throwing the hip inside the turn and not building it up from the ground up over. Um, and I think that's why you kind of see these things. Um, I don't think she, had, she didn't have an issue with that. Uh, uh, Martin, is not toppling into the turn quick important now, please, modern skiing? Or is it close to Let's, let me just transfer it to the, to the sensation you got while skiing. Because what Jamie said already, you don't want to have this passive movement and moments in the turn. You want to be active from the beginning till the end of the turn without waiting for the skis to do something, without waiting for the uh, body to do something. And now back to your question, yeah, you do want to have this sensation of, yeah, the ski is actively prepared to go into the turn. I'm ready for everything. Okay, let's pull the trigger and enter the turn. And the more active you are at the beginning of the turn, the more active you're prepared for this turn already, the more actively you can perform the turn. And at the end of the day, this is what it is. You want to have the this sensation of playing with the forces, of going around the curve, of working against the, the fall line, working against gravity, and then having this sensation of, wow, this, this surfing feeling yeah. there. The energy. The, the energy. Here yeah. we go. I would argue with that with this guy, is he, he is trying to inclinate, trying to topple into the mm. turn. But would you agree that probably the reason that it doesn't happen or it's mistimed is because of this movement here that he makes? He goes... A lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. movement too. And as soon as he goes up in the air, the toppling now becomes much slower. It takes a long time when he's that tall to start tipping over than if he but then, was staying a little bit more stacked and connected to the snow. Sorry, Jimbo. Uh, obviously, vertical movement is not bad. And at this stage, it would be okay if he combines this vertical movement with his fore and aft movement. To like pull the legs backwards. Yeah. To the magic bring ingredient. The Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Combining bring, things that's yeah, difficult. That's it. And obviously, yes, the more you train, the, the more feedback you get, the more feedback you work with, um, the more experience you have, the more things you can combine, and the more it makes sense. Yes. Okay. However, it just takes a while, obviously, in this stage. And I think for this guy, that's what I was saying before about bringing a basic movement into his advanced skiing. And it, it, it limits them then because all the energy that he's generating to try and create that deflection from arc to arc, as soon as he extends up, he just it disperses. He loses all of it. Um, and when we rely on those forces to work with or work against to create, you know, tighter turns. So it's turn in effect shape. a lot of linked single turns. Because yeah. Because he's got no flow from one turn to the other because of the amount of vertical movement is disrupting that flow. That, but also as well, is, is a bit like what Martin said, if you combine it with if you want to bring that ba more basic movement into your performance gain, it needs to be combined with the forward motion. So for me, in the basic turns, it's always extension of the forwards plane. I never actually think about going up. I just forwards think about moving forwards. Forwards inwards or forwards? forwards? Um, oh. <laughs> 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 um, inwards. I'm going to say, yeah, forwards inwards <laughs> if I want to go by the book, but I just think forwards motion. I, I explain it. It's obviously, yeah, you're getting your center of mass across over your feet, so it's happening. I always say in a long turn, roughly 45 degree angle, short turn, 90 degree we angle. We mentioned... The importance yeah. of alpine position and obviously this is a favorite drill from um ski instructors around the world you know the double pole drag and, and look uh, you know i'm not a great drill fan um but um a drill done right and in the right time can be uh, can be optimal when we look at this guy doing his alpine basic position drill here uh, how do you see this skiing and where you would be going i mean we're talking about uh, the double ball track here. What we got to keep in mind, every drill has its target. Every drill has its good points. And the double ball track is uh, talking about all, what we want to do is we want to reduce the vertical movement. We want to reduce this, um, what we said in the previous video, losing the dynamics. So what we can say here, yes, the center of mass is flying quite low. Mm -hmm especially after the turn, there's not that much vertical movement anymore. Um, however, what he is compensating, oh, sorry, the other way around, uh, there's a lack of, of ankle mobility, there's lack of ankle angle, edge angle, and what he's trying to compensate that with is the hip. So he throws the hip in, um, and again, then comes yeah. to this back seat and isn't this passive skiing there. He's waiting for his keys to do something. I think for me, it's, 
it's regarding about how quick we kind of fast track people these days through to these performance exams and everything like that is there's always the big sweeping statement of get your hip into the ground get your hip inside the turn and everything like that but we spoke about earlier on podcasts about grinding about doing your time so for me it's always I always kind of try and take people back over a little bit before we go forward. So working on the feet again, just, you know, simple drills of, you know, railway lines in the snow, working on your big toe, little toe, working on your ankles and knees. And then once they have a feeling of building up um, a solid platform, then let's start to move that hip inside. But is, my argument is, and we're, we're, we're sticking with here, um, Alpine basic position. My concern is that, is that... Alpine basic position that he has already built above the fall line disruptive because that's what that drill is almost created. It's created for me a blocking. It's yeah. almost like his upper body is pushing the outside ski down off its edge because he has developed Alpine basic position because that's what the manual says too early or not. Or would you disagree with that? Yeah, well, obviously, it's 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 the the exercise for me is there to match the angle of the terrain with the angle in the, throughout the body. So it's to create this alpine basic position. But as we know, um, it limits the inclination side of it. So it stops yeah, the cerebral mass to a degree hip. moving inside the turn. So does it creates hip, that block. Does his hip do any more movement towards the ground from there to there? No, because it's not no, possible. No. And the problem I got with this run and in general with the alpine basic position itself, it's we guys are misled by the English word alpen basic position. As you guys said already in the previous podcast, it's not a position at all. In German, it's called alpinus Fahrverhalten. If you translate it directly, it would be like a behavior, an alpine behavior. And what you want to do is you want to build it up constantly. It's not a position yeah. you find and you hold. You never stop moving on there the platform. There you go. And, and Jamie said already at the very beginning, from the very beginning of the turn till the end of the turn, which is the beginning of the next turn already, you want to have a constant movement. You want to be constantly moving. You want to be constantly finding this edge, finding the grip, and pulling the trigger. And don't just yeah sit back and relax because this is where you give up the control. In. And and like for me and these kind of style turns when you are, we are going more performance long, is I generally build it up from rolling the ankles and knees or feet to ankles and knees. And my first few turns to establish steer and pressure. And I think that's what people a lot of the time when they start to do performance especially if they've done seasons of teaching, they go straight into a turn rather than actually allowing the ski to run, build up some pressure underneath, and then you've got forces to work with. And then once I start to feel um, that pressure, and then I can start to move my hip inside. And um, regarding the alpine position in a long term for me, I'm keeping my body, I'm not old school and rotating my body against my legs, I'm keeping my body down the hill, and my turn finishes in the fall line, and I'm softening, allowing my legs to travel underneath my body, which is then pulling my body towards the outside of the turn. I'm never thinking about moving the body at all. I'm keeping that super solid, and all I'm thinking about the movement is 100% my legs and my feet. Yeah. I think a good example of, um, you know, this guy here, for example, here again we see what can happen when we look at Alpine basic position as being a forced position. He He's clearly trying everything to force his body over the downhill ski but equally he's trying to push his hip to the inside and both of these things are cancelling each other out so in effect he's going nowhere and at this stage here we can see this twisting now which is another problem with this countering where people misunderstand what is meant by countering and also there's an issue here for folks watching this guy's equipment was crap i mean literally he was on, on a 20 or one uh, he was on a 50 20 something, tip and 20 then, or something yeah and then he was wearing um touring boots yeah 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 and your equipment in skiing will have a big bearing on how you can progress there's no doubt about that you know and i don't we've said this before bad workman blames his tools but in this case these tools are not helping this guy at all I think it's the younger generation, obviously they watch all the free ride videos and everything, and they just want fat boys yeah. that, that just pull, the, they have that movement arm because your edge is so far away from the center of your foot where it just pulls the flat, the ski's designed more to drift. Um, if you guys yeah, want to progress in skiing, get a piece of ski. Not something that's beyond your level. Don't go fizz or anything like that to start off with, but get a, get a good piece of ski and you'll start to develop good skill sets. 
Yeah. Or even better, you get both of them. Get both of them, yeah. I mean, you can clearly see what we're talking about. Yeah. This guy's turn shape <laughs> and edge button. angle at this point is a good example of how he's flattening the edges of the skis. Once again, he's got issues in his boot. And this was probably his boots, because the guy's a sporty guy, but he was restricted by the, 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 the useless things on his feet. And when you look at how the skis just slide away from him, and when the skis slide away from you, you feel... In, uh, unstable so you, you're always pushing you push more and more because you think oh god god what's happening and as the skis move away it gets it gets even worse you know I mean, a good, sorry to interrupt a, a good idea and a good be feedback for keeping in mind what you want to do and respectively um, fixing what you just said is you always want to build that movement up from the bottom to the top you don't want to push the upper body onto the skis you want to like work from the toes over the ankle to the knees to the hip and then last but not least the body uh, upper body and then the, the head so from the top to the bottom like building up a, a house from the bottom to the top uh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> if we look at uh, me skiing down on the run here this is more an idea of more modernized skiing if you like as well with much more inclination why do we have angulation? Well, angulation is essential. If I inclinate into the turn, that's fine until a certain point. Because once the skis start to slow down, which is now, I need to start moving over the skis. And this is where angulation is created. Or skis I'm, moving underneath or you. Or skis moving underneath or me. I now feel that I fall into the new turn here. And then this is why you have a combination. And if you actually look at the guy behind me over here, we'll see him angulating way too early. And look at what happens. There's, there's the difference between the two of us, because he's blocked himself and I've been able to get my hip down to the ground. He's never moved. So that's why we have angulation. Sure. Uh, just a few words about the last video, guys. Don't get him wrong. Uh, you do see Paul having a lot of vertical movement there when you combine the ground with the center of mass, yes. However, he's got a massive forward inward movement. So he's never losing the grip, he's never losing control. Cause of what just said, making his keys like travel underneath the upper body, respectively bringing the body forward inward. And when we look at the difference between, so you've heard us use words like inclination, and angulation the two skiers here are using different um ways of basically balancing the forces at this stage so we have centripetal force now um and that's what's holding us up in effect when we look at um the positions we can see now what i'm talking about and you always know when somebody's over angulated heavily because the click key is in the butt you see this like position here it comes that big booty girl okay so we're gonna look at um a, another skier um who very kindly sent in his work as well um in this case it's more of a short turn but because it's still dynamic we're gonna look at it it's good skiing again so we're gonna have a a look at his skiing. It looks like a fairly steepish run, um, relatively, you know, soft, easy, grippy conditions, but nice skiing. Absolutely. And you are, if you ask him after the, uh, the end of the run, how he feels like, I'm sure he's smiling. I'm sure he's just enjoying himself after that run. Yeah, it's a really good again, run. Again, obviously, as you say, the snow is pretty, well, soft, easy to ski again it looks like spring skin what i like is, is is constant movement um for me the the upper body you guys can obviously welcome to disagree isn't really obviously there's some absorption there but it isn't in suspension the legs are in suspension i feel like the body needs to be much a little bit more stiller and stronger to allow the legs to to be there for the for the suspension the absorption and the steering but what I love is the fact that he's, he's moving because that's generally the most difficult yes, thing is to get yeah. someone, you know, active in the turn. He's extremely active. Mm -hmm. So it'd be quite easy, I think, to get this guy to still a few things up. So he gets a bit more deflection from the ski because by making that kind of up and over ex over exertion of movement, he just loses his energy in the turn. So he limits mm -hmm. his deflection a little bit. 
What's okay. quite cool to see in these few uh, two pictures here, comparing our skier with Guni, is again the idea of making the skis travel underneath the upper body. And that's the, the core idea behind the short turns, as we're talking about short turns now. You want to separate the upper body from the lower body. You want to be able to like leave the upper body in a stable position where the feet then underneath the upper body, like a pendulum, move from one side to the other. Yeah, you see it in Gary's turns here, how his skis sort of shoot across the hill and, as Jamie said, deflect. Whereas... I think the energy of the ski gets released through his body. Mm -hmm. He's not holding. He's just... He collapses down. He's, he's yeah. over-flexing. So that energy that he could potentially generate... If he I was going to ask you actually stronger, your opinion because my, my observation is... He you talk a lot about spinal punched. mechanics. Yeah, he looks mm -hmm. And he's definitely... A thoracic spine. Yeah, he's not in a strong position. Like he can't position. breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, I can imagine if I was in this position and I try and take a full breath, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. I can use much more. And... Obviously, again, I have to point out from my side, this is what I see is he's too far forward and he has no knee angulation. Again, this is subtilly. You see the, the actual joint slipping away. And what's great about but this... But is, is that a timing issue, Paul? Or do you think it's a lack of mobility? Because he's moving loads. I think he's, he's very sporty, yeah. Too much. Yeah. He's, but this position here, Jamie, is is an issue that you can see the ski drifting away from him. Like that outside ski yeah, is, yeah, we've got is some losing the outside here. ski. I want to point was out... It, was it a cluster? Was it there on every turn or was it just that yes, one turn? Yes, every turn. So every, especially every turn to his left. Yeah, Because um, that's what we need to look for, isn't it? We don't just want to see if it's no. just one mistake. Everybody can make one mistake. Exactly. Is, look, he, is he making it Look at me know, turn making after turn. one mistake. Here is me making a mistake in this run down. So I'm doing a short turn. Are the, are the videos going, are they? Paul says, yeah. <laughs> it's rare he admits it, guys. It's on camera. There's the mistake. If we go back and watch it again, <clears throat> when I make the mistake, okay, and it's it's... It's it's clear to the, the trained eye. When I make that mistake, um, it should be there. So there's the mistake there. Interestingly, what I want to point out is that I make this mistake. If we look at the two of us now, when I make the mistake, those pictures match. That's like he does that on every turn, that, that issue that I had, which we can see the previous turn. This is the turn that was good. And now look at the mistake. Here, that's the difference of how far inside I've been falling inside the turn now. And look at the outside leg on the two of us. It's very, very similar position where I've made this error. True. Uh, you're talking about the error, about the mistake. Obviously, the, the source of the mistake was a uh, turn earlier, like at the end of the old turn, the other one, uh, where you kind of lost the contact. the contact of the snow cause of you gave way to the ski you didn't you weren't able to to use the uh, rebound of the ski to get you into the new turn you lost it for a second although you got a pretty fit body you got this up body tension there you can see because of the stable upper body it's just, was this this tenth of a second where you lost the body tension and this is where the ski kicked in yeah yeah i think you quickly pull the feet back underneath you making that strong aft movement with the angle joint and get the, you know, recover, get the platform back underneath you so you can go back into your rhythm and everything like that. And I, that's what I love about skiing. I love the, the feeling of losing, trying to lose control a little bit and then, then recapture it in the bumps, whatever it is. That's the excitement, feeling the energy of the platform, where, where it throws you around and how you can get back on the center of it. That's, yeah, that's what he doesn't do. <laughs> Which is why, why, look, we need to conclude um, with some idea because the guy might be a bit confused. First of all, we all actively agree that this is a good skier. You know, this is somebody who's got some skill sets. They've got some experience. They're dynamic. They're moving. Um, it, it's it's great to see this type of skiing. We could look at the pole plant issues. We could look at many things. But I would say if I was skiing with this guy, I'd be looking to correct posturally his upper body and his strength in his upper body and his mechanics within stabilization of his spinal mechanics. And then I'd be looking to address that issue there, which is, which is a cluster. It's on every single turn. He is not able 
to actively use his subtalar joint. Now, this could be a boot restriction, navicular or something to do with his biomechanics in the boot and the boot actually pinning it down and not letting him move freely. It could equally be just a misunderstanding because that to me looks like a long turn leg as opposed to a shorter leg but you can see it moving away because he's not getting on top of it yeah kind of add to that feedback mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. um i would try to reduce the, the movement in the upper body because it's really active really dynamic really working for the turn right um i'm quite sure he's might be quite tired in the after day i would address the same point as you just said but I wouldn't blame the boots. Boots. I would work more on the ankle movement, like ski with open ski boots, like ski without poles, like blocking ski his upper body poles. actively, yeah, yeah, yeah. all this stuff. And yeah. even more, uh, ski off piece, ski moguls, where he needs to move his ankles. I'm not talking about moguls like you know, in the foreland, but more like crossing. The the issue where everybody keeps saying it within the ski industry nowadays because i think everybody's worked out the importance or oh, i need to be more active in the ankles i need to be ankles what on earth are people talking about though because to me it's a very gray area and obviously if you do know the the mechanics of the ankle and stuff it does help but for the average you know person who's not great on anatomy what are we talking about with this movement in the ankle? Because I get the feeling that people don't understand the importance of stabilize, stabilizing the ankle, ankle tension maybe, and the fact that if you let your ankles just soften at any point, it's it mistimed, it's very hard to get back on top. So when we talk about these, and I know both of you have mentioned it, ankles, 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 is it lateral? Is it fore aft? Is it dorsiflex, plantar flex? What are we actually talking about? Uh, well, we gotta make sure we're all in ski boots, right? Where the ski boots are quite tight, where the movement is absolutely restricted in both ways, like laterally and far off. <laughs> However, uh, we're talking about the sensation of the ankle movement. And the less movement, the less range of movement we got in the boots, the more we gotta take advantage of this little bit. Right, and when I, when we are talking about ankle movements, or when I'm talking about that, I want to give my clients the idea of, hey, you are able to move the ankles. Yes, the the is restricted. However, you want to have the sensation of the the lower leg pushing against this keyboard with the shin and with the calf, right? Like okay, so you're, you're, you you do. Because obviously the, the, the people who are advocates of almost like hanging off the front of the boot. I, yeah. I don't like that personally. Yeah. Um, I tend to almost be in the opposite position. Uh, <laughs> I'm hanging off their tails. Yeah. I think it yeah. depends on the client again. I think if your client is on the back of the boot, you might need to go to an extreme and say, look, I want you to hang on the front. So he finds that middle. Well, what happens if they hang so on I the think, front? Does that not bounce the arse oh, back? Yeah, 100%. So, but I'm saying it depends on the client, depends on what's going on in the turn. I think for me, you're saying like what, what happens inside the boot is you feel all these inversions and different things that you were talking about with the foot earlier on. You feel that you're, you know, you're rolling onto the big toe, little toe. Regarding the tib and fib, you feel not the front of the shaft. You feel more the lateral side, the inside and outside of the shaft that the shin bones are going in Which, that direction. Do you not think that's these? the issue? Is more with ankles. It's the problem that people don't have lateral awareness and rotational awareness of the ankle. Then, yeah, they get the idea of slamming forward or being pushed back. I, I think, Martin, you can jump in after me, but, right. but I think it's more they don't use your feet because everyone says, oh, ankles and knees. So you, you miss out the actual that the foot makes the initial movement to create that lateral motion in the tibia and fibia. So I think they don't think about rolling their feet at all. They think more about using something higher up the chain. But like we said with the, the long turn of just throwing your hip in before building up a platform. And that's when you lose the contact and lose the grip. Yeah. And and what we want to do is we want our clients to get rid of the idea of that the, the foot and the lower leg is fixed in the boot. You want to move the ankle. However, when we're talking about ankle movement, it's this big picture, as you said, from toes to the ankle. So okay. you want to have this tripod on your sole of the foot. You want to feel the the lower leg in any way you want to make sure you're active on the knees you want to make sure you then in the right situation move your hip as well as the other chance so it's it's basically the sensation of moving the ankle yeah but in fact you're moving on feeling all these parts down there 
Yeah, and also it's 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 the foot of you know what part of the turn and what part of the foot are you on as well. You said the tripod, but you work from front to back as you go through the turn because you're using the full length of the platform. Um, it's do, just, is that what you feel? Because you know sometimes from a strength and conditioning side, we we talk quite whole footed, and the ability to be. Um, to get power, the minute, let's say, if I was going to um, do the deadlift that Thor did the other day, 501 kilos, for example, you know, I wouldn't try and pick something up off the floor standing on the balls of my feet. I would want to be whole-footed at that point. So surely within the turn, particularly the apex of the turn where most forces are building up, you'd agree that you're very much whole-footed at that point. Yeah. So initiation phase, I feel ball and toe, big toe. It apex of the turn, that for me is the end of the turn. That's where I'm trying to get my deflection from. I'm feeling the whole footed, that's the power phase of the turn. That's why I'm trying to get that rebound from the ski. And then after that, I feel like I'm going whole footed. So I feel my whole foot, but I feel mainly my pressure on my heel. For my personal, for myself, what I feel inside my ski boot regarding the fore and aft feeling within my so foot. So like this diagram here, yeah? If we take the red, is the yellow being the skis, the red being where the pressure is, and the dark red being where the most pressure is, would look at that and say that that's how you are releasing the curve, where you're moving more tail heavy, then you're coming much more centered um, at this point. And then even immediately after the apex, I get a sensation, and I know it's, it's controversial, and I know it might make people go, oh, but I actually have a sensation of being very heel dominant power at this point here for example i don't think it's controversial on high high end skiing i think it's possibly if you think in ski instructor skiing um it might have some controversy because they're constantly you know they kind of they finish their turn later on because in ski instruction we're looking for everything to happen after the fall and in effect when you've got recreational guests because every action has that equal and opposite reaction so you're pushing on the platform after the fall line to create that deflection to get the ski go back up the hill and um, to give you control. That's what we're trying to give our clients. So they've got the confidence to go off and ski. But as a, as a performance skier, we're trying to get that sensation of the pressure in the fall line to create the deflection in the direction of the next turn. So everything happens earlier and I'm, I'm the same. I feel like I go probably not as much as you for watching our skiing on video, but I feel like definitely goes to the heel as soon as the fall lines, fall lines, you know, happened after the apex. I feel like I'm definitely going towards the back of the boot because you're trying to get that energy to squirt the skin in the direction of the next turn. Which it, it's interesting from an association point of view, when you start looking around the world at the manuals and things, there's a, there's a lot of attention given to um, Alpine basic position or Kerpa Knick or whatever you want to call it, because this lateral um, teaching is far easier than getting somebody connected to the snow and working in the other plane fore and aft. I think fore and aft is one of the more difficult planes to teach in, and it doesn't really get picked up as much by many associations as being the dominant factor. In the next um, vlogcast, we will particularly be paying attention to the missing factor that is fore and aft, and the fact that in the future, we probably believe that, well, I do believe that this needs to be the focus before excessive lateral balance. Hope you join us. See you then. Bye. Bye.